Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas for day two of exclusive coverage from SiliconANGLE, Wikibon's theCUBE. We're here at Amazon Web Services reInvent Conference, talking about the cloud, public cloud, and uh, I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host Dave Vellante, and our next guest, Teresa Carlson, Vice President Worldwide Public Sector of Amazon Web Services. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you for having so me. So you're in charge of the government sector, uh, state, local, NGOs, universities, education, the whole gamut. All the fence um, staff. And uh, so obviously the top news uh, was the CIA contract that you guys beat IBM against. Dave and I have been talking about this for uh, quite some time since we got a, a copy of the public information about uh, your win against IBM, of which IBM contested. Um, so I know you really can't talk about it, so I'm not going to ask you about it, but, but I'll just say it was a huge win. Um, the judge himself said, Amazon clearly a far superior solution. Dave has a chart on Twitter they put up. You guys really really knocked it out of the park. It was one category under controversy. But for the most part, this is really the acid test for uh, success um, in the marketplace in general, yeah. especially IBM involved. But in your area, talk about what's happening in the business, because that, your area is really high growth for, for cloud. Talk it, about the dynamics is. of your, your market. It is, well, it's, it's an interesting market. We really, at Amazon Web Services, we started the public sector business at the end of 2010. And I announced at the conference we had in September that we now have over 600 government customers worldwide and over 2,400 educational institutions. And that ranges from everybody from the intelligence community to the Department of Treasury, to uh, Health and Human Services, to the Singapore government, uh, to the United Kingdom with G Cloud, to Harvard, Stanford, MIT. Uh, it's an amazing portfolio and we've really grown. It's, it's an exciting it's, it's business. Like, it's a perfect fit really for the folks. Those markets are, I won't say understaffed, but you know, the IT has always been challenged in some of the certain areas. And yes. you know, I'll see Obamacare's website, which we couldn't get going, but three kids, get it up and running in three days. I don't I know if you saw that I heard news. They, uh, you know, I heard so. they added some servers the other day. I was like, well, why don't they just dial up Amazon? What's the deal here? So talk about the dynamics. Obviously, you know, obviously that, that case of the young kids coming to fix Obamacare is just kind of a side, you know, orthogonal note, but that is really the power of the cloud. It's a speed yeah. game, right? So like, talk about the dynamics of the customer base that you guys are selling into, and, and what's, their, what's their environment look like, and why Amazon is so successful there? Well, uh, Amazon Web Services is just a perfect partner for the public sector space. One, because of the way things get budgeted and the ability to really pay for only what they use. And they are very tired of paying for a lot of things that they just don't use. They, they don't want to be, they don't want to pay for high cost servers that are sitting there idly that they're paying for and not, not utilizing. But the other part is they want to be innovative and agile. And you know, that's not typically something that you think about when you think about governments and education. But today that's changing because they are really trying to let more uh, agile small contracts that the government can really take advantage of to show successes. But we're, we're really a good partner with them in terms of the ability to walk in, show them how they can create and drive a project home in a very short period of time with scale, with depth and breadth of that, and to be able to fail fast and recover fast. Talk about the aspect of big data, because obviously yep. the on the application side, that really seems to be the hot area in the government since government 2.0, and you have all this data. We've, yep. we've talked to folks about you know, healthcare data, and um, Obviously the application is driving it all. What are you seeing for applications? What's it like? What's the developer uh, market like on that, on that public sector? And what are some of the, the things that they're doing with say big data or the applications? Yeah, yeah. well, so there, there were basically in the US government, we'll talk about the US, there were four phases of actually how they got to the cloud. Phase one was this cloud first policy. Phase two was NIST to find the cloud. Phase three was this Fed ramp FISMA fed ramp the compliance, and phase four is the acquisition. So what are they doing with it? They started with the low hanging fruit of website hosting. Then they moved into things like uh, collaboration sites, internal and external. Now they're doing things like big data analytics and management of that data from everything to like biosense with the health and human services of tracking disease or flu across the US for, for health officials to doing uh, things like autism research that can be shared with hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world that can crowdsource on that data 
and, ch and change the world, basically, on how research is getting completed. And they do it fast. They do it very fast at a very, very low cost, and they love that. They like the spot pricing, too? Are they utilizing that? They do. That? We, you know, we do have public sector customers using spot pricing, but we also have an ecosystem of partners, ISVs and SIs even, that have figured out how to use spot pricing in their models, which helps the public sector customer because they pay a lower uh, fee or cost for those solutions. Dave always jokes about the uh, data center and the enterprise being an API in the future. The government is kind of going that way, so you know, they must love the API approach that you guys have. What are some of the things that the, your partners are doing, your channel partners and the API? Go ahead. Well, when Viva Kundra yep. you know, pushed the cloud first initiative, I was happy because I said, great, finally, their government is going to be more efficient with our dollars, <laughs> right? So that was, that was good. It wasn't without its challenges, obviously, but yeah. can you talk about what's different in the government and why Amazon had to create GovCloud separate yeah. from AWS? Well, so GovCloud was a model that got created uh, because NASA, JPL, actually came to us and said, look, we need an environment for ITAR specific regulatory environment. And ITAR is an environment for, uh, it's a regulation for defense contracting business units. So anything that's ITAR related data, it has to be ITAR. So it's another one of these compliance mandates. And we actually built this environment that's a community cloud really for US federal government and their partners that they select to go into this cloud. And it is not just, it, it's, it's built like all our other AWS cloud um, regions around the world with the same level of security, except it's for this community and it's ITAR compliant. So if you have an ITAR workload, you have to go through the same process, background checks and all that for ITAR. And it also has something uh, unique endpoints, FIPS 140-2 endpoints. That, uh, that NIST likes, so we've, we've got those in there as well. Uh, and it's really growing. Our GovCloud region has grown over 300% this year, and it's uh, some amazing workloads from the defense, aerospace and defense side to uh, rockets and spaceship kind of applications like the Mars Curiosity uh, that we work with NASA on. But that's, that's the real reason, but it is built, and it has a lot of the same services. But it also, one other unique element, it has to have US persons. So we roll out our services a little bit um, delayed because we, got, we want to make sure that we, it's a service that this community wants, and we have the right US persons, and it can be ITAR, uh, compliant when it gets When you say there. U.S. persons, you mean U.S. persons managing the infrastructure, is that right? That's right, so that's correct. For those. Amazon employees. That, that's correct. They have to be Same, based US, in the U.S., U.S. citizens, I mean all. U.S. persons, not citizens. Not citizens. It's, it's U.S. So persons. US persons. That's the ITAR uh, mandate. What's a U.S. person mean? They mean physically they're in the U.S.? It's, well, and, and that they have a work visa, that they can be here, they're legal to be in here. Yeah. You, Andy this morning was all rattling off like dozens of certifications that yep. you guys had, yep. including FISMA and, and FedRAMP, and yep. there were many, many, many others. So th are those, those are unique to GovCloud, is that correct or not necessarily? So um, FISMA and FedRAMP are both, uh, and DICAP are things that are government related, and uh, FedRAMP is like the sister to FISMA for cloud. So the federal government, mm. after you, you said the cloud first policy earlier, yes. I was just saying there are four steps to that. It was the cloud first policy, the NIST definition, and then it was FedRAMP, which uh, is the compliance module that we have to meet to do business in the cloud in the US federal government. And we, we have two packages at AWS for FedRAMP. We did GovCloud, and we did all the other infrastructure in the US as a separate package. So, if a federal government customer asks us, we would support them by giving them this package through FedRAMP for either GovCloud or you know, US East or West within our regions in the US. So you obviously had customers on AWS, government customers, prior to GovCloud, right? That's right, so, yes. So what's happened now? Do all those customers have to move to GovCloud or is it no. just they encouraged to do so? or? It's, They're required to do so? What's it's the a great question. It's actually their choice. Uh, we found that there's a lot of US government customers that based on the architecture and design they put together, they are fine with US East and West. 
there are others that really want that workload in GovCloud, and some they need to have it in there because of ITAR. Like the NASA example, they have ITAR requirements or someone like State Department or DOD, if they have workloads that are ITAR mandated, they have to be in an ITAR location. So that increased your market, the, obviously, exactly. doing, the, doing the GovCloud. And we really built that based on our customer requests, like we do many things that you heard Andy talk about today. Our requirements are 90% of these new features and services come, be, are built because of the customer requests. So, so it's really not, you're not really doing a, you are doing in a way a special for the government, but it's not dramatically different than no. your traditional AWS cloud, is no, that right? No, absolutely not. It's, it is the same, it's the same services that they would get in any cloud, it's just a special um, community with this special regulatory environment. And you know, we're really committed to uh, public sector around the world, and as Andy talked about today, if there are these other requirements that come up, we're going to work hard to meet these, and we're already doing that in like Australia and Singapore and Japan. So we're going to work hard to make sure that we can meet our customers' requirements. You're saying essentially exporting the model, right? right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if they, uh, and especially on the compliance side, because when you work with public sector, especially governments, um, you know they have they have environments and they have compliance controls that they want you to be able to meet. And that's just part of doing business in that environment. And if you're committed to that sector, you're going to have to step up and do that. And we want to do that for our customers. We may not get everything done overnight. We're going to do it in the right way. It makes sense also for Amazon Web Services. But we all. But the other important part, I think, for this broadcast is that um, we're also educating a lot on the new ways of doing things. Because you can't always, if, if if you're handed compliance requirements that are about traditional old data centers with an old structure, that doesn't make sense for a modern cloud environment. So just like with GSA and the US federal government, we worked really jointly with them and I think FedRAMP is a great example of how you can do that together and have a, a really positive end result. Teresa, I have one final question. I know you got a tight okay. timeline. Um, talk about what's changed uh, over the past few years in terms of contract, contract compliance. I mean, Amazon yeah. is a little different, different animal compared to the old school, yeah. um, I don't know, the old guard, as uh, Andy was saying on stage today. Um, I mean, it's like a groove swing, you know? Yeah. Here's the price, kind of like the bid process and the procurement is changed. So what's changed? What have you learned? Uh, along the way to get Amazon really in that position yeah. to, to win these big contracts and be successful? Well, I think there's two things that are really important. One is that um, we really do, we are committed to saving the customer money, number one. Number two, we are committed to giving our public sector customers those price drops. So th the things that are changing in government contracting and Department of Interior just let a $10 billion 10-year contract for cloud with 10 vendors, and five of those were Amazon Web Services. Five of those partners bid Amazon Web Services. But what they're already seeing in the task orders that are coming out, we're getting feedback from the customer. They love it because the agility of how quickly these contracts are actually not just coming out, but the results, it's the results that they're getting. And when they get a result and they see the cost and value margin, then they, they immediately go out for another one. So it's just ra sort of so rapid So did you have to wrangle the GSA? I mean, how did, was there a lot of um, in the trenches digging around and changing contracts? Uh, it's, a, it's a big culture change. It's a lot of education on what cloud is and isn't. And you can see the aha moments in the early days when they see that you can go to literally a console and spin up instances and you're not waiting six months to buy servers and then four more months to configure them and test them and get them ready to go. And the good thing about what we were talking about on the Fed ramp, when you spin up instances and you have, they're ready to go. They've already been, they're under the compliance review. It saves so much time. Yeah, and people want to see immediate results these days with government. So like yep. you've seen getting those apps out there, certainly the big day is fantastic. Teresa, thanks for coming on theCUBE. We're getting the hook from uh, your handlers here. Uh, <laughs> great to have you on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Uh, we're here live, exclusive coverage, Silicon Angles, theCUBE. We're right back with our next guest here at Amazon Web Services reInvent Conference live from Las Vegas. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.